Alyssa just mentioned, uh, right after the sermon, there's going to be a time of prayer for the Peru team. They are leaving tomorrow. So just know that that is happening. If you're able, turn with me to Colossians 3, verses 18 through chapter 4, verse 1. Colossians 3, 18 through 4, 1. This is the word of the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. God, we just read the very words as if you walked into this room and we all sat quietly watching you come up here and open your mouth. That is what this is. And though it's weighty, it is powerful and able to cut and encourage and rebuke like no other message in this world. And so I ask for that same power to flow through me, that you empty me, just a jar of clay, that you fill me in this church with the treasures of your word, and that that will overflow onto others. And so we need you, Jesus. I need you. Apart from you, I am nothing. I can do nothing. So I'm going to attach myself to you, the vine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When I was in graduate school, in business school, uh, one of the last classes I took was an entrepreneurship class. And in that class, I learned a lot of things, but the most significant book that I read in that book, in that class, was a book called Pour Your Heart Into It. And it was by a man named Howard Schultz. And if you don't know who Howard Schultz is, he's the founder of Starbucks. I read that book in the mid-2000s, and at that time, Starbucks was a household name, but it was nothing like what it is today. And reading that book was really interesting because you, you have this autobiography of this man who has started one of the largest companies in the world. And the one thing that stood out from this book was this concept of the third place. And what he means by that is, in a society, you have home, you have work, and you have a third place. Howard Schultz wanted Starbucks to be the third place. And that means, as a secular business owner, he knew that in any society, in any civilization, any time period, the two most fundamental institutions were your home and your workplace. And even here, we know how much time we spend in either of those two locations. And he wanted Starbucks to be that third place. When you go from home to work, stop by Starbucks. When you go from, home, from work back to home, stop by Starbucks. And if you're at neither one of those places and you're meeting up with a friend, go to Starbucks. That was his mentality. And we saw how successful that became. So the home, think about how much we are and we've been shaped by your home life, whether you're an adult or, or still a child. The way your parents raised you, their values, their temperaments, their marriage, 
and your disobedience or obedience to them in the home. The family unit, I would say, is the most important social institution God has ever given us and also happens to be the very first one that he introduced in creation, man and wife. What about work or school? How much of our current lives, time spent, your thoughts, your preoccupation has to do with either work or school? It's more than I'd like to admit as a business owner. I think there are days, my wife can attest, I can't stop thinking about work. It consumes me. Christianity has had a tremendous impact on or even created many of the social institutions we know today. Hospitals, universities, orphanages, but none is more fundamental to a society than the family and the workplace. If you're here with us for the last few weeks, Paul just got done focusing on relationships within the body of Christ. Now that we've put on these new clothes, we ought to act this way and that way within the church. Now he's concerned outside of the church, in the home, and in the workplace, or in your schools. In this passage, Paul introduced three pairings, wives, husbands, children, and fathers, or parents, and bondservants, slaves, or masters. Before we get into each of these in more detail, I, I have to make something very, very clear, and that's this, that before we can make Jesus the Lord over our home and our workplaces, he has to be lowered over your own heart. And so if you're tempted to jab your neighbor when the topic of wife or husband comes up, please keep in mind this message is for you. And make sure that the Lord of your heart guards you against comparison. The word Lord in this short verse appears six times, six times over and over again. And it just highlights the importance of his lordship over all about what we're going to say. And I think as Christians, we verbally freely admit Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. And yet when things get difficult or when we disagree with what's in this book, we can struggle with that lordship, can't we? He starts this section, if you've noticed, quite abruptly. In other sections, in this book in particular, he starts with a therefore or if then. But in this passage, he goes right into it. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. But it, it, that's not by accident, because what precedes this verse and what ended last week's passage was this verse, chap chapter 3, verse 17. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. That principle acts as both the main idea behind how we ought to dress, which we covered last week, and also acts as the support for every instruction that follows that verse, which includes this section here. First, what does his lordship mean? It means that our individual roles at home and at work have been specifically assigned by him. These roles have been assigned by him. Each role has been assigned, and that's why it has to begin with submission to his lordship. If it doesn't, then our families and the workplaces, they're going to collapse. By what? The way of the responsibility, by your own rebellion when things get difficult. There's no greater reason to be this way in the home or in the workplace than the fact that Jesus is your lord. It has to be that. Second, submitting to his lordship means that our roles are ultimately accountable to him. They're given by him, which means they're accountable to him. In our flesh, we're tempted to follow God's order only when we want to, when it's convenient, or when the other party complies first. I only submit to my husband if he loves me like Christ does. I'm only going to love my wife if she first respects me and submits to me. I won't exasperate my children as long as they obey me and honor me and so on and so forth. However, the Bible makes it clear our responsibility is not dependent on other people doing things for us first. Now, touching briefly on some exceptions, and it's not going to come up, just, just listen. Listen. 
God does not call us to submit to abuse, to anything unbiblical, illegal, immoral. But generally speaking, we're going to be held accountable to these roles that we're about to cover here that God has given to us. In addition to the concept of Christ's lordship, there's another important aspect that I want to talk about briefly, and that is this, that they're reciprocal and countercultural, this relationship. The first part of the groups, wives, children, and bond servants, those are people in positions in that society that are already used to a way of life in that culture. But even within those three groups, Paul gives very radical instructions on how we ought to be in these roles, our attitudes, and the right motivation. However, instructions to the husbands and the parents and the masters were at the very outset completely radical to the listeners at that time and was a complete fundamental departure to what they were accustomed to. So you'll see here Christ is bringing a massive change to how we approach the home and the workplace starting 2,000 years ago. Wives, let's start with the word to the wives. Submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. We discussed this topic of submission at FH Together that many of you were a part of, but we'll cover again briefly here. It is no secret that this topic causes a lot of controversy in our culture. But I want us to be reminded of something, that this instruction is repeated very, very often in Scripture. It's here. It's in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Timothy 2, Ephesians 5, Titus 2, 1 Peter 3. Now, in our day, I would say, for the most part, any pushback related to this concept of submission has to do with the fact that they argue it's merely contextual. It's for that time period, in that culture, in that day. It doesn't apply to us today. But as I just mentioned, this instruction was given to churches all over the world, in Asia and in Europe and in the Middle East. And when Paul alludes to it in 1 Timothy 2, he actually alludes to creation when teaching on the order of the family showing that it transcends culture or time period. It dates back to the creation of the world. And it's also interesting that we never really hear about the next verse being contextual. Husbands, love your wives. Oh, that's just contextual. We don't, we're not obligated to love our wives that way today. And the call is to submit to your husbands. This is not a general rule of submission for every woman to submit to every man. This is within the context of a Christian household. Ephesians 5.22 has the same command, and it adds this little phrase, your own husband. Submit to your own husbands. And clearly stating the unique context of that command. It's helpful to clarify some things about this word submission. First, Paul doesn't use the word obey as he does for children and slaves. This isn't some unilateral call for obedience, but rather it's a willingness to put oneself under the authority of another in the context of a complementary marriage relationship. Second, submission does not mean inferiority. And we see this in a few ways. Galatians 3.28 clearly affirms the equality of men and women in the kingdom. Jesus, who is our model for everything, himself willingly submitted unto the Father in everything he did. But I don't think any of us in this room would ever say, oh, I think Jesus is a little bit less than God the Father because he offered himself in submission to him. They are equal in power, they are equal in glory, but they are different in roles. Third, submission is not absolute. And I touched upon this briefly, but there are times when a wife must refuse to submit to her husband if he's violating the word of God, if he is abusive, etc. So submission for the wife, scripturally, is meant to be in the context of a loving marriage relationship. Lastly, Paul includes this very important phrase, as is fitting in the Lord. 
The Greek form expresses an obligation. It's a necessary duty. And it points to Christ's lordship. And this is how he's designed the family to be operating. So the wife is called to obey this command out of love for her Lord. Not necessarily out of a response to her husband's loving care because that can be severely lacking at times. Husbands, let's move on to you and me. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Paul is introducing something very radical here. And I think it benefits us to know a little bit more about the cultural context. According to Jewish law, the woman was a thing. She was equivalent to a house or flocks or any other material goods in the house. She had no legal rights. Husband can divorce her for any reason, while the wife had no rights of divorce except two things. One, if he gets leprosy, or if he becomes an apostate, if he falls away from the Jewish faith. Only two reasons. The husband, he himself could be out and about in society, the marketplace, business meetings, synagogue, by himself, whenever and however he pleases. The wife, never allowed to leave the home alone for any reason without her husband. This was the case in both Jewish homes and Greek homes. All the privileges belong to the husband. All the duties belong to the wife. Very unpleasant. Now, it's in that context that Paul is telling husbands to love your wives and don't be harsh with them. In Ephesians 5.25, the parallel passage, Paul adds a little bit more. He says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. This word love is the word agape. We're familiar with that word. And this form of the verb, as Paul loves to do, it's a continuous action. So this isn't a love of passion or emotion or feeling. This is a word of choice, day after day, loving, sacrificing, consistently. And that phrase, don't be harsh with them. Why would Paul add that? I wonder how common it was back then for husbands to specifically be harsh with their wives. How easy is it for us men when we get angry and short that we're harsh with our wives? A parallel instruction comes from 1 Peter 3 when Peter instructs the husbands to be understanding, to show honor to their wives. 1 Corinthians 7 even assumes that the Christian husband is anxious about how to please his wife and vice versa. The wife is anxious about how to please her husband. So scripture again and again points to this radical change in how husbands ought to see their wives and treat their wives. And that can only be accomplished if we recognize Christ's lordship in my heart. That's the only power that can do that in me. There's no other power that can change a man in that extreme patriarchal culture and in my own prideful heart, too. To treat my wife with this much care, gentleness, and love, even today. There's cultures and nations where this concept of husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church, it's foreign. It's not practiced. It's not culturally acceptable. It's very countercultural even in our day today. Husbands and wives, as, as we're renewed in our souls and our minds, we take our marching orders from Jesus for our household, and we have to ask him to help us in our sinfulness and our weakness to do these things out of a genuine love for him and for our spouse. This paradigm shift culturally, it doesn't stop with the spouses. He moves on to the parents and children. The children, similar to the wives in that culture, they were under the complete rule of the father of the house. There's a Roman law called patria potestas. And under this law, the father could do anything to the child that he wanted. He could sell him into slavery. He could make him work as a laborer in his fields. 
He even had the right to condemn and execute his own child under this Roman law. Again, all the privileges belong to the father. All the duties belong to the child. And it was in this context that Paul tells children to obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. This word children is a general term in the Greek, and it isn't limited to a specific age group. That means if you're still living in the home, you're still under the authority of your mom or your dad or both, this applies to you right now. This command clearly states we ought to obey our parents in everything. So it removes any situation where just because you don't agree or you don't feel like it or you're mad at them that you have permission to disobey. At the same time, though, similar to the wives and the husbands, we're not called to obey when that obedience requires us to disobey God. Jesus warned that he came to bring a sword within the family. That son will go against father, mother against daughter. That means, for some of us, that call to follow Christ will require you to disobey your parents. Commands. In order to honor God. But, in everything else, there is no compromise. We're to obey your parents for it pleases the Lord. God seems to place a very high value on this command. In the parallel passage in Ephesians 6, he adds the fact that this command goes all the way back to the Ten Commandments. Now let me ask you, if you were a ruler of the universe for one day, and you had to set forth ten laws for human civilization to operate by, would you put honoring your father and mother in your top 10? I would put do not murder, do not commit adultery, don't steal from each other. I would put those things, even honoring the Lord your God. I don't know if I would put honoring your father and mother in the top 10. But I'm not God, and he knows more than I do. And this is a command not only in the top 10, but it pleases the Lord when it's followed because it's the first commandment with the promise. And what is that promise? It's that you may live long in the land. On the other side of that coin, dishonoring your parents is something that God detests. Striking or cursing one's parents as well as continued willful disobedience and rebellion was punishable by death in the Old Testament. That's how serious of a crime God saw it. When describing the ungodly, the ungodly characteristics in 2 Timothy 3 and Romans 1, Paul includes this long list of characteristics. Lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, abusive, gossips, slanderers, haters of God, inventors of evil, heartless, disobedient to parents. He includes it in both of those lists. So it is the mark of the ungodly, and it has no place among believing children. Parents, that means God has a very important word for you, for me. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. The passage says fathers, but it should be translated parents. It's the same Greek word that shows up in Hebrews 11.23. But I'm actually glad that they use the word fathers here, given the context of that culture, and probably a common stereotype that may even exist today, that it's the mother's job for child rearing. It's not the case. It's both, fathers and mothers. It's a responsibility to both. The command is short. Don't provoke your children, lest they become discouraged, but I want to elaborate on this a little bit more. Generally speaking, to keep it very simple, Scripture calls parents to do three things. Disciple their children, discipline their children, and do not discourage your children. So parents, whether you like it or not, Scripture places the responsibility of training your child 
in the Word of God on you. It's not the church's youth group or the children's ministry, as good as those things are, especially in our church. It's not their primary job to do that for you. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 talks about the parent's responsibility. Teach your children diligently the words of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 4 tells us to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Here at this church, we emphasize discipleship groups. And in my opinion, it's one of the most important ministries that we have for spiritual growth and formation and just building up this body, instructing in the word of God. So how much more so is it important in your own house to give our children that solid foundation on which they could stand for the rest of their lives? Because the reality is, as much as we love our church, and I love our church greatly, it's one to two days a week, a few hours a week. But where are your children spending the other 95% of their time? It's at home with you and under your authority and your influence. So it's only fitting that we as parents take on that discipling role. Second, Christian parents should also be disciplining their children. The Bible describes a parent who spares the rod as one who hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Proverbs 13, 24. Discipline, it's the means by which we straighten the path for our children. Left to themselves, by nature, they will veer. Discipline is keeping them on that straight and narrow path. Of course, we need to be careful, though, because we shouldn't be doing this out of anger, abuse, emotionally or physically, but we model discipline after a loving father whose discipline is formative, not punitive. You think of it this way. God, he never punishes his children for the sake of appeasing his anger. He doesn't do that. But he does it in order to correct and to build up to become more like Christ. And that should be our goal of disciplining as well, to shape them to be more like Christ. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11, it's a really beautiful passage. I recommend you guys read that. It talks about God's discipline for those he loves and those he disciplines he treats as sons. A few weeks ago, I was talking to one of my sons about this subject of discipline. And I told him, look, no matter how much people at church love you, no matter how much your grandparents love you, no matter how much your friends or your friends' parents love you, there's only two people in this entire world that are going to discipline you and even spank you. It's me and your mom. And it's because my love for you is greater than all those other people because I have one thing that they don't. I'm your dad. You only have one dad and one mom. And you're my son. No one else in this world can call you that. And so my goal for my kids is that I discipline with the goal of Christ-likeness because that's what God does for me. And lastly, we're not to discourage our children. And this speaks specifically to this command of don't provoke or don't exasperate. A parental attitude that irritates and frustrates the child intensely. And this can take many forms, but here's some to think about. Setting unrealistic expectations, constant criticism, demanding perfection, showing favoritism, failing to show affection, flat-out neglect, and excessive discipline, just to name a few. Parents, guard your hearts against these things and disciple your kids in the Word of God. Raise them up in loving discipline, and please don't discourage them. All with the ultimate goal, which is Christ-likeness. The last group is bond servants, or I would say, generally speaking, those under authority. This could be an employee, could be a student, or whatever else situation you find yourself in. 
some people argue that Paul here is actually endorsing slavery because he doesn't come outright and speak against it. He doesn't try to endorse a rebellion against the institution. But Paul made it clear earlier that there are no barriers in Christ, slave and free being one of them. And in 1 Corinthians 7, he even encourages slaves to gain your freedom if it's available. So Paul here, he's not concerned with abolishing slavery. That's not his main goal. Rather, it's how you ought to live in whatever social reality you find yourself in, in a godly manner. In the same way, God never looks to abolish work when it gets difficult, to strike down your boss when he or she is being unfair, or to always take you out of a bad situation. That's not God's goal for you. Because God knows the greatest social and cultural and personal transformation comes from a spiritual renewal in his people through the power of the gospel. That's his focus. Talk about an upside down kingdom, right? Paul is saying something probably that is shocking to both the slave and the master at that time. Instead of telling the Christian slave, hey, I want you to rebel and overthrow this evil institution, he tells them, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. William Barclay, he's a Scottish scholar from the 20th century, he says this, Paul insists that the slave must be a conscientious workman. He is in effect saying that his Christianity must make him a better and more efficient slave. Christianity never in this world offers escape from hard work. It makes a man able to work still harder. Nor does it offer a man escape from difficult situations. It enables him to meet these situations better. Now what about us? Are your bosses as bad as slave masters? Maybe you might think so. But out of all the groups we talked about, slaves by far had the worst lot in that society. They were literal property. There was no proper code of conduct for how the masters ought to treat you. They had zero rights, couldn't marry, could be killed at any time with no consequence to the master. So with that logic, I think these instructions would be easier for us as employees, as students, to apply in our workplaces than it was for slaves to apply to their masters back in those days. And Paul adds, do this not by way of eye service, as people pleasers. This is embarrassing, but I'm gonna confess something here. When I was uh, working in the corporate world, uh, I had a cubicle, and it was a three-wall cubicle, and behind me was the main hallway where people would walk by. And I would be so sensitive to when people walk by, and I knew the sound of my boss's footsteps. I knew it. And so I'd be doing things on my computer that I shouldn't be doing, I wouldn't be working, but the moment I think he would walk by, I click into a spreadsheet and just stare at it like this. Gone, okay, Netflix or something else. It, it got so bad that I didn't do this myself, but I heard from a coworker that there was a software you could download that put a little icon on the bottom of your screen and that when you clicked on that icon, this like elaborate spreadsheet with bar charts and graphs just popped up. It had nothing to do with your work at all, but it just looked like you were so busy at work. And I was tempted to download that, but I didn't. But that just goes to show where my heart was at as an employee. I was a people pleaser. But we all have these tendencies, don't we? I'm a boss now. I know when I come to work, people act differently. I get it. And we're on our best behavior when our boss or our teacher is around, but when they're gone, quote, the, the mice come out to play, as they speak, as they say. But look at the motivation and the attitude behind that instruction. It is this. Don't be people pleasers with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. <laughs> 
if you knew that Jesus was in the same room as you or in the same class as you, his loving gaze upon you, whether your boss was there or he's out of town, how would you approach your work or your classroom or your study habits when no one's watching? Your productivity when you know your boss is going to be out for the next two weeks. How would sincerity of heart fearing the Lord change you? Verse 23 says, and whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. God cares about the what, which is whatever you do. He cares about the how, working heartily. And he cares about the why, doing it unto the Lord. This command sounds familiar because it's the same command as the end of chapter 2 when he says, whatever you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we can apply this concept to all the groups we discussed today, can't we? Not only that, God attaches a promise to this command in particular. Verse 24 promises us that we will receive the inheritance as our reward. So, we might not get recognized at work the way we think we should. We might get overlooked for that promotion that we thought was for sure ours. You might not get the grade you thought from your teacher because he or she just pegs you as a bad student from the very beginning. I know my sons feel that way sometimes. Or you get just unjustly treated by those in authority over you. But what this verse is telling us is your heavenly father sees everything, and you will get rewarded in full for your obedience to him, in full. But equally so, he gives a warning that for a wrongdoer, he will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. He, when I first read this passage, I thought he just made a switch to the bosses, but he's still talking about those under authority. He's not talking about the masters yet. And so God knows our disobedient hearts, my disobedient heart in the workplace or in the classroom. And even if you're his child, God doesn't show partiality in that you're going to reap what you sow and you will be disciplined for your disobedience. If you're a child of his, you will be disciplined. If you are not a child of his, you will be judged in his wrath. Either way, because God sees things, we are comforted, and yet we ought to be fearful at the same time. This last group, masters or employer or anyone in authority, his instruction is very simple. Be just and fair in how you treat those under you. And the warning being that you too have a master in heaven. That means in the church, a slave is a Christian brother with his master. Think Philemon and Onesimus. It's even possible that a slave is a leader or an elder in the church with oversight responsibilities over your master in the church. Think of that. Truly upside-down kingdom that Paul is instructing this church to follow and that you would have to believe these instructions were just so jarring to that culture. Hearing love like this, submit like this, obey like that. In that culture where it was just totally not that. And against everything that we feel in our, in our flesh. Everything changes for the Christian. For you and me. So the call to you, if you're an employer or anyone with authority, is you treat your people as Christ treats you with fairness, justice, justice, gentleness, and grace. So whether you're a manager of one, or you're the CEO of a 10,000 person company, or you're the president of the United States, everyone on earth has a master in heaven who will hold them accountable for their role of oversight. In verse 11, Paul says that slave and free are all in all in Christ. So how are you doing in this area if you manage people? Do you manage as if the Lord is present and you're going to hold yourself accountable before the Lord? Or do you treat those under your authority with injustice 
and favoritism and bias. As I get older, I, I notice a lot of situations where Christian men and women, they're revered in the church. Sometimes there's pastors and they're leaders and they're respected members of their congregation and they serve in so many ways. And they're also wonderful people just to be around, you know, amongst friends and social settings. They're personable, they're kind, they're generous. But their home and work life says otherwise. Husbands are terrible at loving their wives, sometimes even abusive. Wives are constantly disrespecting their husbands. Parents are absent or dismissive or overbearing to their kids. Children are disrespectful and disobedient to their parents. Employees are honest and hardworking only when their bosses are around. And those in authority take advantage of their people. They're unfair in how they treat their employees. They're abusive in their power. Who we are in the home and the workplace, which is where you and I spend the majority of our day and also where our guard is down the most, that is who we really are. So who are you, really, when it's just your family or when you're with your non-believing coworkers? Or if no one's watching at all but Jesus himself, who are you? Your guard is down. You're not in a people-pleasing mode. Would someone look at your private home and work life and say you're really clothed in righteousness and you're looking more and more like Jesus? I pray that is the case. And everyone here, we fall into one, at least one of these categories, some of us multiple of these categories. And God has given us specific blueprints on how we ought to behave in these contexts, in these relationships. And as you've been following, our theme for the book of Colossians has been highest of heights. And that God is most pleased when we elevate the name of Jesus as high as we possibly can. And ultimately, we do this by doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we give thanks to God. And Pastor Brian covered Colossians 1 a few weeks ago, but we'll end with this. It tells us that it's by him and in him and through him that our homes are sanctified, our families are restored, and our workplaces are holy. Let's pray. God, you have given us some very clear and simple instructions but how far many of us are from obedience in these areas. We are hypocritical in who we are at home or at work versus who we are at church. Our ugly side, as they say, comes out most with those closest to us when our guard is down completely, when we have no one else to impress. And yet remind us, Holy Spirit, that Jesus, when you left, you left your spirit with us to dwell in us to be with us wherever we are. Let that be a challenge and encouragement and let it incite a little fear too, knowing that the holy eyes of God are watching us and grieve when we sin with those closest to us, when we are so prideful in our hearts and refuse to obey your command and make you Lord of our home and our work or our school. So again, we can do none of these things outside of you. And so Jesus, please help me as a husband, wives, children, and parents, and employees, and employers, and students, and teachers. Help us all to fulfill these roles because they have been given to us by you. And we will be held accountable for them to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite... Uh